Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Scaling a business is incredibly difficult and complex. While founders and early stage executives are often focused on trying to create and launch a market viable product, it's not uncommon for strategic people management issues to be an afterthought. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Freshworks about the importance of promoting and measuring employee engagement while scaling your business. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Vidya from Fresh Team, the data software service uh, from Freshworks. Freshworks, as uh, you may know, uh, is a software as a service unicorn, which has around 250,000 customers using its suite of products. Uh, at Fresh Team, we are curating uh, a number of interviews uh, of thought leaders. Uh, in the HR space who in influence and inspire us. Uh, and we also put together stories of uh, people and organizations that have gotten their growth strategies right. And uh, today we are delighted and honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Jonathan Westover as our special guest. Uh, he is uh, managing partner and principal at uh, Human Capital Innovations. He is also associate professor of organizational development at uh, the sorry, at the business. And uh, I'll hand it over to you, John. Thank you and welcome uh, to this interview session. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I was really uh, pleased to have the opportunity to connect with you. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to share um, some materials with the Freshworks community. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I am uh, I work with Human Capital Innovations in terms of my consulting work, um, but I also uh, work in the organizational leadership department in the Woodbury School of Business at Utah Valley University. So uh, my home is in Orem, Utah. Um, for any of you who may be unfamiliar with uh, with Utah, we had the we hosted the uh, 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. So uh, that's that's one of our uh, bright moments uh, on the global stage. Uh, in addition to my role as department chair and professor in the organizational leadership department, I'm also the academic director in the Center for Social Impact at Utah Valley University. Um, so I wear many hats uh, and all of these hats lead to the same general space. And that is um, the opportunity uh, to help organizations be more successful, uh, to be uh, more efficient, and uh, to address the, the difficult challenges and problems that every organization faces uh, each and every day. So my remarks today, uh, I'm going to talk about implementing and measuring employee engagement and satisfaction, generally at first, but also uh, specifically looking at um, the scale-up environment uh, for uh, startup businesses that are scaling, but also for uh, other organizations that may be going through a period of transition and scaling up their business as well. Uh, and we'll be doing some Q&A and asking some questions along the way. Uh, and I welcome any offline follow-up uh, to any of these materials or additional questions you may have. So please feel free to reach out to me at john.westover at gmail.com uh, if uh, you uh, would like any more information. Um, as was mentioned in the brief uh, introduction, um, 
I've been working in this space for a long time. Uh, for a couple of decades, I've been working to help transform organizations across the globe. Um, and maybe one other aspect to my interdisciplinary approach and how I address things, uh, in addition to what's already been shared, is that I'm also a faculty fellow uh, for ethics and public life in the Center for the Study of Ethics. And so you, you start to see the, the uh, combination of organizational leadership, HR, OD, um, along with social impact and ethics. In my mind, all of these areas go together and are very important as we're trying to address complex uh, problems within organizations. So what I'm gonna cover over the next uh, uh, little bit, I wanna start with a general look at why do we need to pay attention to strategic HR? Why is that important in the current world of work? And why would it be important in the future of work? Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about the research on creating a culture of employee engagement and job satisfaction. Some of this related to my own research, some of it related to other uh, research out there in the field. I want to talk a little bit about measuring employee and organizational engagement. Uh, and then I'm going to share an example of an organization I've worked with as a consultant um, who went through rapid scale up and faced all sorts of organizational challenges. Uh, and uh, I'll try to address specifically some of the things that they could have done and should have done in terms of uh, measuring employee engagement and satisfaction and creating that healthy culture. Uh, and then I'll wrap things up looking at the intersection of leadership and service and what I argue is really important in any organization um, in today's world, and that is that we break free of our functional silos and find an opportunity to have a more interdisciplinary approach to how we address our, our, our problems uh, that we face, both as societies, but also as organizations. Okay, so let me start with a really quick look at strategic HR. Um, this isn't a surprise to any of you, I'm sure, but we have HR management systems that are the, the policies, practices, and systems that influence employees' behavior, attitudes, and performance. And these are, it's like a Venn diagram. These are intersecting um, components, all of which influence each other. So better behavior influences attitudes, which certainly influences performance, but vice versa. Performance in, uh, uh, influences attitudes, which influences behavior. Behavior influences performance. They're, they're all interconnected, and there's um, linkages all over the place. And so within HR, we're trying to think of how do we systematically structure organizations in such a way through policies, practices, and systems that we can hit all three of those areas to lead to high performance work systems. When a company has effective human resource management, they have greater innovation, greater productivity, and they have a better reputation in the community. And in today's hyper competitive global marketplace, uh, this is really important because consumers do care who they shop from. They vote with their with their wallets and with their checkbooks, and they want to know that they are supporting organizations that have a social mission, that are socially responsible, uh, and that are, are ethical in how they deal with the, the different issues that they face with their employees, with the environment, and with the consumers. And so when we have effective HR systems, we're able to, uh, to generate better brand loyalty, better customer satisfaction and loyalty, uh, and it's, it's a really powerful mechanism. It comes back to this idea of human capital. So when we talk about HR, uh, another way to phrase that is, is human capital. Uh, in, in think about all of the different forms of capital that you have within an organization. We have our, uh, our financial capital, of course. We have intellectual capital. We have property um, equipment. Um, we have all of these different elements that we rely on for the organization to, be, to have a strategic advantage and uh, a competitive advantage. And we invest in those forms of capital, we protect those forms of capital, and we make sure uh, that they will uh, be safe moving into the future. Uh, the same should be true for our human capital. So organizations um, have employees, and those employees are the source of their creativity, their innovation, their productivity, and their ultimate success. Those employees bring with them certain knowledge, skills, and abilities that you might be able to measure on a resume, or through an interview process to, you know, to, to bring people into the firm. Uh, but there's also a lot of intangibles that are actually really difficult to measure and make up the entirety of the human capital, the human asset, uh, when people come to organizations. 
It's the, the holistic nature of all the training and experience, judgment, intelligence, relationships, and insight that they bring with them to the table that will help them collaborate with others on complex problems that will help them to address complex issues and ultimately will drive better innovation within the organization. So we want to make sure that we value human capital just like we value other forms of capital and that we treat it as something worthy of our investment uh, so that we can leverage it to the greatest extent possible and get the best bang for our buck. Everyone within an organization who has any sort of leadership role, even all the way down to the line supervisor, performs human resource management functions. Um, so whether or not they have HR in their job title, they do HR if they're leading people. Um, so even a supervisor that's only supervising two or three people on a regular basis, they're going to be doing all of these things that you see in this diagram. They're going to be helping to define the nature of the job itself. They're going to be forecasting future labor needs. They're going to be providing training, the front line of training for those people in their team. They're going to be involved in the interview process and the selection process for new people on the team. They're going to be doing performance evaluations and performance management. They're going to have to um, deal with all of that feedback uh, and provide meaningful coaching and feedback to their employees. They will be the ones that are involved in recommending pay increases and promotions. They're the front lines of communicating corporate policies, and ultimately it falls on the supervisor to motivate uh, both in terms of pay but other intrinsic factors and find other ways to uh, meaningful, salient ways uh, that are valued by employees for you know, other benefits and rewards. Uh, and so from the lowest supervisory um, frontline level all the way up through the organization to middle management on through, up through executive levels in the C-suite, Anyone who's leading other people and managing people is doing HR work. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people um, who are in those roles are never trained in HR. They are never trained in these functional areas and they don't actually know how to do these things. And this is particularly relevant within the startup space and within organizations that are rapidly scaling is a lot of times you have, uh, you have founders who have a great idea for a product or service uh, some really great innovative approach to uh, addressing a, some sort of consumer need and generating demand. Um, and they, they start a business and they start the product, uh, providing the product or service. And then all of a sudden they see rapid growth and they go from maybe one or two people on their startup team to five people, to 10 people, to 20 people. And then all of a sudden they're, they have a hundred employees, 500 employees, a thousand employees. And their expert, their area of expertise is in maybe in uh, coding. Maybe it's you know they created an app or they they have some sort of um, uh, specialty in information systems or they have you know some sort of technical um, expertise that allowed them to start this business with this really great idea. But they don't have any background in leadership. They don't have any background in management. They don't have any background in how to do all of these things that every person that manages people has to be able to do for an organization to be successful. Um, so that's really partly what we're talking about today is how important it is for every organization from new startups all the way up through mid, you know, mid-sized organizations, scaling up through large organizations, they need to pay special attention to the role of human capital and the role of HR within their organization. When we have high performance work systems, it leads to higher profits. So there's a ton of research around every single arrow that you see in this diagram. Um, and there's lots of, I could add other boxes and other arrows. So basically there's tons of research that shows when you have high performance work systems um, that come out of a strong HR, human capital and employee centric um, culture within an organization, it leads to higher profits. So just a couple of those relationships, you can see the pathways here. Uh, interesting jobs. When you design interesting work for your employees to do, that leads to satisfied workers. That leads to lower absenteeism, lower turnover, lower costs and higher profits. It also leads to more satisfied customers, higher sales and higher profits. But on the other side of the equation, when you have a, a really positive workplace culture where people feel safe, they feel valued, they feel like they can contribute and they want to contribute, 
uh, and they're not worried to fail, but they're, they're, they're going to try new things. When you have that kind of an innovative knowledge sharing type of a culture, it drives innovation. It drives creativity. It drives higher quality, which leads to better customer satisfaction, greater productivity, and higher profits. So HR and hum, uh, human capital and employee, uh, uh, an employee eccentric, um, employee centric culture, um, it's, that's just not warm, fuzzy, fluffy type of stuff that we're talking about that directly also hits the bottom line of the company. It, if you invest in the human capital, just like investing in other forms of capital, you will drive higher profits. Uh, and there's so much research to demonstrate that. So uh, those are some of the types of things that we're going to continue to explore together today. Another issue that I want to briefly address is this idea of uh, person organization fit uh, and person job fit is a, a similar construct um, and value congruence. That's another similar construct. So the, it's the basic idea that when you bring people into the organization, that that person come, brings with them and all of their um, collective experience and background and, and worldview and perspective, they have values that they bring with them to the table. Uh, they have a driving purpose, you know, answering their why. Why are they? Why do they want to be there? Why do they want to be part of this organization? And when the the alignment between the person and their values, and the organization and its values is really tight, and that that there's a close alignment, we say there's a high person organization fit. When there's that a close alignment with the specific job that they're performing, we would say there's a high person job fit. Um, when those values align, another term is, is value congruence. Uh, and so basically when there's high person job fit, high person organization fit, and high value congruence within an organization, that leads to higher job performance, um, stronger future job choices, lower rates of intent to leave and turnover, higher job satisfaction, higher organizational commitment. And these are all things, these are all outcomes that organizations should want. Um, because ultimately it will lead to a high performance work system that will help the organization to be profitable and successful in a sustainable way. Uh, not just something that will help them be successful this quarter or even this year, but as, especially if they're scaling, they have to be thinking about a year out, five years out, 10 years out, and putting in place the systems, processes, policies, structures, and systems that will help them to manage that growth and to mature as an organization. And that will only happen as you have good people within the organization to help that growth occur. Uh, another way of thinking about this in, in terms of job, uh, person job fit, person organization fit and, job, and value congruence is the, the mission of the organization. Uh, and this can lead to strong engagement outcomes for employees. So what is the mission statement of the organization? Now, you know, a new, a new startup they very likely um, aren't necessarily focused right from the get-go about a mission statement, about a value statement, um, because th they, they're, they're excited about the product or service that they're providing. Now, depending on how they're seeking funding, if they're going, um, trying to get uh, investors or they're trying to go get a business loan, you know, they're gonna have to create that statement as part of their prospectus, um, but, but that's not, in terms of the formal documentation, but that's not always the first thing on their mind. Um, but it's a really important aspect that you want to be thinking about when you're starting up a new venture. Um, what is the driving purpose of this organization? What value are you going to add into the world? And that needs to be reflected in your mission statement. And when you have a mission statement, um, a powerful mission statement, that's a reflection on the, and there's, there's a clear reflection of the, the, the internalization of that mission statement within the broader organizational culture, that then drives higher levels of organizational commitment of employees within the organization. And that leads to better um, uh, performance outcomes for the organization. And it leads to higher levels of personal engagement from employees within the organization. So we can't overlook sometimes the cliched elements of like mission statements, value statements, purpose statements. A, a mission statement in and of itself doesn't do anything. So if you, if you just create a nice, nicely worded mission statement or a nicely worded value statement, that's not necessarily going to do anything for your organization. But when that mission statement is truly embedded into the organization and it 
the culture reflects that mission statement, then it does matter. And then it will drive higher levels of performance and engagement of employees. Now, really quickly, I wanna share with you a model that I've developed in my own research in terms of um, work quality characteristics, employee engagement, and job satisfaction. Uh, so here you see a, a diagram uh, that shows relationships within the, the uh, a statistical model. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with a complex um, uh, statistical model output or anything like that, but you can see the, uh, the inner relationships here and the feedback loops here and how they influence everything. And when we think about employee engagement, we think about job satisfaction, we think about designing uh, meaningful, effective jobs, these are all the types of variables that lots of research has demonstrated are really important, including a lot of my own research. Uh, and I've done a lot of comparative international research where I've looked at how this model plays out across the globe, across dozens of countries, and seeing the similarities and differences in those countries about which of these factors are more important in particular sectors and particular types of organizations of uh, different levels of jobs and so forth. Um, because there's what I, what I hope will come across here is that there's not an easy fix. There's not a one size fits all to employee engagement and job satisfaction. Um, and as you see in the, the uh, uh, quote at the bottom, context matters. A meaning is derived from context. Observations are embedded and must be understood within context. So a, a national context, a, a local context, an organizational context, a job context, all of these things matter in terms of how you're going to design uh, engaging, satisfying work for your employees. And we can't overlook that part that we have to tailor and specialize our approach. Um, but here you can see general um, individual control variables uh, in terms of individual and family circumstances, organizational um, characteristics and job characteristics, all sorts of things that are important to consider uh, different ways of slicing the data and different ways of understanding different types of employees. And in terms of general buckets of variables that are really important, we have work-life balance types of variables, we have intrinsic rewards, we have extrinsic rewards, and we have uh, work relations types of variables. Uh, and there's interrelations between all of these and, and then they influence job satisfaction and employee engagement. Um, so when we have a better sense of what our organization mission is, what our values are, and the type of people that we want in the organization so there's a high level of person organization fit, we can then start to do the hard work of designing uh, engagement uh, evaluation systems so that we can see where our employees are at in relation to these types of variables and others um, so that we can ensure a really meaningful and powerful organizational experience for them uh, where they feel valued, they feel supported, and they, they can continue to help the organization to succeed. All right, now, other things to consider in terms of measuring employee engagement. Again, I wanna hit home this point that there's, there's not a one size fits all, okay? Uh, I'm gonna share with you some, some basic approaches um, as a starting point, but you need to understand that every organization is different even similar types of organizations within the same industry or sector are still different. Um, their founders are different, their culture is gonna be different, the types of employees they attract are gonna be different. And so we just, we can't just use a one size fits all. So these are general thoughts and principles that can be a starting point for additional discussion, dialogue, uh, exploration within your individual organizational context or your individual unit that you can then um, flesh out to create an engagement strategy uh, for your organization. It starts with determining engagement outcomes uh, for your organization. Um, you know, I have a certain way of defining employee engagement uh, other, another firm might have a different way of defining employee engagement. And, and within the academic literature, there's kind of a general consensus about what that means, 
but within organizations that might be a little bit different and what matters to them might be a little bit different. So you, if you want to measure something, it always starts with first clearly determining what the what those outcomes are that you want, right? And if you don't have clear alignment between the, the outcomes that you're gonna try to achieve and the metrics you're using to measure, then you're never gonna get to where you wanna be. So uh, first it starts with determining engagement outcomes. And then you need to start going through the process, and this is hard work, uh, but you need to convene groups of employees so that you can, through focus groups, through, through interviews, through uh, different means, so that you can get employee input into the process and you can create employee buy-in into the process. If your engagement strategy and the, your, your approach to measuring engagement within your organization is just a top-down, the, the C-suite says we, we're gonna use this survey, um, now everyone go do it and managers make sure your employees do this. If that's the approach, uh, it's not gonna be particularly meaningful or helpful for your organization. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're creating employee buy-in. But I, I will fully, fully uh, recognize that that takes more time, that takes more resources, that takes more energy and commitment to do it that way, um, but it will lead to better outcomes. You need to identify what's really truly important to your employees. What are the salient motivators of your employees? And just because something you know, if you're if you're a CEO or you're in the C-suite, just because something's valuable to you at your particular stage in life doesn't mean it's that same thing's going to be valuable to the other people working with you as part of your team. So you need to talk to them. You need to understand what they really truly value. And if you're going to try to seek um, ways of leveraging their capacity and and help increase their motivation and engagement levels, it if there's a misalignment between what you're offering and what they want, then you're not going to have the desired outcomes, uh, plain and simple. And organizations miss this point all the time. It is so common for organizations to not be clear on the outcomes, to not have um, mechanisms in place that employees actually value. And so then it just becomes a, a, an exercise of collecting data that's not actually particularly meaningful or helpful to helping things improve within the organization. You can also perform a driver's analysis, similar to you know, figuring out what's important to employees, figure out what, and, and this can happen through data analytics and, and uh, statistical analyses, but what actual drivers are the most important? Um, so sometimes employees say something's really important to them, but when you actually do the analysis, you realize, oh, that doesn't actually play out in the data. Um, it doesn't, it's not actually as important as they say it is in, ter in terms of how it influences their motivation and, and performance. So doing a driver's analysis is also going to be important and not just doing that one time, but do, doing that on a regular basis, um, you know, every year, you know, revisiting um, the, the core drivers. Um, use pulse surveys and single click polls, not exclusively. That's not going to be your only way of trying to get this, the, to get the pulse of your uh, people and to understand what they want and need. But that can be one mechanism to, to get some of that data. Uh, develop a continuous listening strategy. Uh, something as simple as, and it sounds cliche, but something as simple as an open door policy um, can be really powerful. Or have, if you have shared workspace where you're actually interacting with each other on a regular basis, making sure that you're approachable so that people can come to you and talk to you um, and share with you. Making sure that employees know that you want to listen to them, that their input matters is really, really important. And if you create that kind of an environment, then not only will that in and of itself will lead to higher engagement, um, but it will also help you better understand what they need and want in terms of support, in terms of, um, in terms of the various motivating factors so that they, they will perform at a higher level. We often talk about exit interviews, um, which are important. If someone's leaving, we should want to know why, especially if, you know, if they're leaving for you know, what they see as a better opportunity somewhere else, we need to understand why that's happening. Um, but we don't wanna just do that when people are leaving. If we're losing our best employee because they see greener pastures somewhere else, you know, we, we can learn from that but we don't want them to leave in the first place. So a stay interview is also very powerful. 
and you can have regular stay interviews with your employees, particularly your best employees. Like what is it, what, what do they value about being part of the organization? What will it take for them to stay with the organization? Have that discussion on a regular basis with, with all of your people, but particularly your best people. Um, turn to employee recognition activities. You want to make sure that all employees um, know that what they're doing uh, is valued by the organization and you want to make sure that they're acknowledged for that work. Uh, and so there's lots of ways to do this, but think about how to do recognition activities, uh, measure things like retention rate by, by division, by department. Um, you want to not just know a, a generic retention rate for the overall organization, but you want to be able to, to see specifics under individual leaders even. Um, so you can understand if there's a leadership problem, for example, and and track productivity metrics. Again, if you if you start with outcomes uh, and you know what you want to achieve, that will inform your metrics that you're going to measure over time. Um, the types of productivity. Some types of productivity metrics may not actually be all that relevant to the type of engagement you're trying to drive and the types of pro the types of um, outcomes that you're trying to drive. So just make sure that you're thinking. Uh, about those metrics always. Uh, when I think about metrics, for example, I think about the movie Moneyball. Um, you may or may not be familiar with that, um, that movie or that book, uh, but I would encourage you to look into that, read, to watch the movie. It's a great movie. Read the book. It's a great book. Um, the whole point of that is looking at, a, it's a true story, looking at a major league baseball team as they're trying to better, have better alignment between the types of things they're measuring how they're putting together their team and the performance of the team. And ultimately they come up with new and innovative ways to do that, that allow for better alignment and fit that ultimately help them to be very successful, even when they don't have a lot of money to put into getting the best players. Uh, and not that I wanna advocate for not paying people, you know, for what they're worth uh, and the value they bring to the organization, but we all, you know, we, we have limitations with our resources. And so we also need to be very uh, thoughtful about the metrics we're using and making sure that the right metrics. We also need to be thinking about organizational culture and, and engagement. So not just, um, not just individual engagement, that's super important, but what about that, um, the engagement across the organization, across groups and teams, and the individuals within those teams, institutional relationships, that are important and looking at the vertical and horizontal relationships within an organization. Uh, we know that a lot of people leave jobs because of their manager, for example. So everything else about the organization could be great. It could, there could be great alignment between um, the values of the employee and the organization, a really powerful, engaging mission, uh, great purpose. Uh, everything else about the job could be wonderful, the types of work they're doing. And if, if the relationships with, with their team and with their manager are poor, uh, people will still leave, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to make sure that we're monitoring those relationships and have mechanisms in place for that. So one simple tool that everyone could start using right away uh, was developed by the Gallup, um, by Gallup. Uh, it's called the Q12 index. And many of you may already be familiar with this. It's a very simple, it's 12 questions, which means you can easily build this into interviews or create a very simple survey that you send out to employees asking these questions. Now you can formally go through Gallup to be a part of this. Um, and if you go through Gallup, then the data that's collected from your organization goes into their big pool of data for, for they have hundreds of thousands of data points across organizations across the globe. And then you can get um, analyses that look at how your organization stacks up to organi other organizations and such. So that can be powerful comparative data that you can utilize, but whether or not you formally go through Gallup to do that, uh, you can st still use these questions within your own organization to measure really key areas of engagement. Do you know what's expected of you at work? I mean, expectations are so important, right? Do you know what your manager wants to be done? Uh, is that clearly communicated to you? And do you know what, how to fulfill that, right? If, you, if that's not the case, there's gonna be a clear mismatch in terms of your effort and what you're accomplishing, um, so that's important. Um, do you have the materials and equipment to do your work right? At work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day, or are you stuck doing other menial types of jobs that you don't, that 
you know, don't really leverage your capacity uh, or what you bring to the table, so on and so forth. So you, you can see all these questions. You could very simply with even just, I mean, you, you, could, you could use a, a Google form. Uh, you don't need any special software. You could use a Google form, put these questions into it, send it out to your team, get their input, aggregate the data and track it over time. And that would be a powerful mechanism for you to have a general sense of engagement within your organization. And it wouldn't cost you any money uh, and you could do it immediately. Uh, every organization could do this tomorrow and it would be super simple, right? And it would start to yield some benefits in terms of uh, insights to your organization, whether you have five people on your team, 10, 50, 100, 1,000, okay? So that's, that's one approach um, that uh, would be super simple. Now I wanna share with you an example of an experience I had as a consultant with an organization that was going through rapid scale up um, because of confidentiality in terms of the, the, the consultant client relationship. I'm not going to specify the organization, but I, I can talk in general terms about um, what they were facing and the types of issues that they were facing and those sorts of things. Um, this wasn't a new startup. Uh, this was a local family-run business that had been around for several generations. Um, so this, this, this company had fine-tuned their approach, their, their product, and the services they provided. They knew what they were doing. They were doing it well. And because they were doing it well, they were approached by investors. And when the investors um, uh, came into the picture, they had this huge influx of money. Uh, they had new people involved in the decision-making of the organization. And very rapidly, uh, over the course of about five years, they expanded from about 100 employees uh, to well over 2,000 employees, not just locally um, within one, pretty much within one metropolitan area, but certainly within the state, but then going nationally and having hundreds of locations uh, nationally within just about five years. That is a really difficult challenge for any organization to face. Um, and I would argue it's perhaps even more challenging for a family run business that's scaling up rapidly than even a new entrepreneurial endeavor, a new startup that's scaling rapidly um, because they, they had a lot of baggage, right? They, they, they had generations worth of, of knowledge built up um, within this, this organization, within this family running this organization. And now they had new investors, they had new people, you know, uh, voicing their opinions about uh, how to do their business and how to do it uh, effectively, cost efficiently, how to scale it, all of those types of things. So that transition, uh, I think was particularly hard for it. I think that kind of a transition is particularly difficult for any family run business, but I think it, it definitely was a challenge for this organization that I worked with um, going through that transition and bringing in people that aren't part of the family and, and key leadership positions and decision-making positions. Any organization scaling up that rapidly is going to struggle with just the maturing nature of the organization, the increasing complexity of the organization. And that was certainly the case here. They went, this particular uh, firm that I was working with, they went from a very basic management structure and hierarchy um, with really just a couple levels and and everyone knew everybody, and the, all the leaders were family members. They went from that situation to now they had a much more hierarchical structure. They had many, many layers. They were dispersed not just across a metropolitan area in a, one state within the US, but now across the whole country. Um, and they were having to deal with just all the policy issues related to that, all the legal issues related to that, all the leadership issues related to that. And it was really challenging, which leads to the next point of developing organizational leaders. Traditionally, with family members doing running all of the leadership roles within the organization, that simply wasn't possible anymore. Um, and those, those family members didn't necessarily have the abilities, the competencies and, and the capabilities to be able to run such a large organization. So, you know, they, they were good at doing what they were doing as a family run business, smaller scale, but now the complexity was just so, so much more that they, they, those family members didn't know how to do it. 
And so new professionalized administration was brought in, new people were brought in, and they were also trying to raise up people within the organization to take on leadership roles. That whole process was incredibly difficult uh, for this organization. They were also trying to maintain the core of their organizational culture. So what they'd experienced for generations as a family run business now was getting, you know, and being dispersed nationally and bringing all these new people. Any organization would have to work really hard in that situation to try to, um, to maintain and have a sustainable um, positive culture. And frankly, this organization wasn't, accomplishing it. Uh, they, there, there wasn't consistency. Uh, there, wa there wasn't consistency in terms of communication. There wasn't cons consistency in terms of how policies were interpreted and implemented. There wasn't consistency in all the institutional mechanisms that helped to reinforce the culture. Uh, so they were dealing with all the problems related to that. Because of this, they had a couple, what I would say were two major challenges that I was brought in to help them face. Uh, one was just a huge level of employee turnover. Now the industry with uh, that they were in uh, relatively, I mean, it's all relative, right? Uh, we, we always have to think about industry norms uh, in terms of what normal turnover is. Um, but this industry tended to have a little bit higher turnover than, you know, some other industries. So that in and of itself wasn't uh, a problem that they had high turnover but the massive amount of employee turnover that they had, which, which outstripped industry no norms, uh, they had about 10 times the industry norms for turnover. They had an incredible amount of turnover uh, within this organization, in part driven by problems with the culture, problems with the organization, problems with the leadership. Um, so people were coming in and they were leaving. Um, and they went through, uh, the, they went through uh, this, just this revolving door of employees uh, over the course of a year. And at one point we calculated, even for the lowest level employee within this organization, which the, the, for the lowest level entry level employee, um, really they just needed a high school education um, with not a lot of extra you know, skill or specialty. And so even for that type of person coming into the organization, we calculated that it cost them about 5,000 US dollars uh, for each of those people. So you, and you start to multiply that 5,000 times just for this lower level type of employee, um, they estimated, uh, well, we actually we calculated that they went through about 2,500 um, hires every year just for that lower level type of position. That is insane levels of turnover. And, $5,000 a pop for each of those people, we're talking millions of dollars um, that that's costing the organization in the constant revolving door. And we're not even talking about uh, higher levels of positions. And there was turnover in those higher level positions as well. Uh, and, and that's more expensive, right? When you get into higher level positions. Um, so how do we address this turnover problem? Uh, that was one of the key questions. And addressing and confronting the internal leadership and politics, because you had this tight knit family that had been running the organization for a long time, and now you have new people coming in. There was a lot of butting of heads, uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, people saying one thing in a leadership meeting and then going behind people's back, backstabbing. Um, uh, a lot of passive aggressive behaviors where people would say one thing to your face and then do something different when you weren't around. All those types of things were happening. And I experienced many of those things firsthand um, as I'm trying to, to understand the complexities of the challenges of the organization and talk to different leaders, getting different stories from different people, um, helping them develop measurement tools to understand their engagement and satisfaction that was influencing the turnover issues that they were facing. That was incredibly challenging because I was getting different information and being told different stories based on who I was talking to. And there wasn't consistency in the leadership team. And there wasn't a consistent buy-in from the leadership team and even having me there as a consultant to try to address these issues. Some people were grateful that I was there trying to help because I was bringing you know, an expertise to the table that they didn't have. Other people, you know, were very skeptical and very, um, felt very defensive and 
felt like I was dangerous because I was there because they felt like that would put their jobs in danger. So all these dynamics were at play uh, as I was trying to work with them and to help them. Now, I, I worked with them for about a year and a half. And during that time, we, we put together some really good measurement tools. We implemented them um, consistently and holistically across the organization. And we started to see some good outcomes. We were getting really positive feedback, especially from um, supervisors and kind of middle management level people within the hierarchy. They were really loving what the types of insights they were getting and the types of analytics we were providing them. They were, we were helping them make better hiring decisions. We were helping them retain their people. Uh, there was a lot of good positive movement. Unfortunately, I didn't see the same type of excitement at the executive level in the C-suite because many of them felt defensive and they felt, um, they, they felt that they were being put in harm's way because of the approaches we were taking. Uh, and it ultimately culminated and there's, there were still continued problems in terms of the finances. Um, there's expenses were out of control and we, we just weren't getting the, the, um, the traction we needed with even the improvements we were having to help them stave off some of the financial troubles they, they were having. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.